Hey, everybody. Quick announcement. This is Colt from RenewalCast. We are going to do something that we haven't done before. We are going to have a Law Gospel Week. Did you know there is a Law Day in our country? It's May 1st. It's a day that's actually set aside for uh, understanding how the law and the legal process protects our, our liberty. And we need to understand as Christians that the law gospel distinction does help protect the Christian liberty. We need more than just the, the civil use. It, it seems we need a, a law gospel week and we need to understand these things. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to have an episode of the podcast released every day for a week, and it's going to be on this law gospel distinction. And we're also going to have a blog that's going to post every day that week as well. Some of the material is going to be rewind because we've talked already a lot about this law gospel week. Uh, Some of it's going to be new. We're going to do this the, the week of April 28th through May 4th. You might be asking, why do we need to spend a week focusing on the law gospel distinction? I would say it's worth a week of our time just to, to focus on this. Let me just give you a, a few reasons, right? Uh, first, it helps us read our Bibles better. Second, this category keeps us from legalism and license. Uh, it, it gets the doctrine of justification. It, it helps us in evangelism. Fifth, it, it helps uh, with pastoral ministry. Uh, counseling ministries, preaching ministries are, are, are affected. And finally, Christ gets the glory he deserves. Christ is the one who fulfilled the law so that we're not under the law in the do this and live sense. We're free because of what Christ has done in the Christian life to obey. Not out of obligation, not to earn a right status, but we're, we're free because Christ has earned that and done that for us. So it's tremendously good news for believers as well. Plan to, to join us on RenewalCast as we celebrate uh, Law Gospel Week. Uh, listen to the podcast, think about these things, read the, the blogs, and thanks for, for joining us. Of course, we hope that and pray that this is just going to be a, a great encouragement to you. So thanks, everybody. Now on to the show. Hey everybody, welcome to Renewal Cast. Today, today we are going to talk about the subject of justification. Justification is a very important subject, and to help us uh, think through the doctrine of justification a little bit is Mike Abendroth. He's been on our show before, and welcome, uh, Mike, to the show today. Really glad you're here. Colton Jay, I'm glad to be on. I heard your last show that you had me on was very lowly rated, so we'll try to increase those ratings today. Yeah, that, that's that's one thing with our podcast is we have a lot of room to, to go up. <laughs> uh. it, it was R.C. Sproul's mentor, John Gershner, who said of the human race, in light of depravity, there's always room for deprovement. Thanks for joining us today. We really appreciate it. And would you just take a, a minute, Mike, and just tell us a little bit about yourself, what's been going on uh, with you and your life, your ministry, your family? We'd love to hear a little bit about you and catch up a little bit. Sure. It's my favorite subject myself, see? <laughs> Enough about you. Let's talk about me. In all seriousness, I'm a husband uh, to Kim for almost 35 years. I better think of something exciting to do for our anniversary on June 6th because 35 is a big one. And I am a father to four children who all profess Christ and love the local church. Praise the Lord. Haley's 30, Luke is 27, Maddie's 24, and Gracie is 22. I'm also finally a grandfather to little Amos, who's about 15 months old. And I'm also expecting to be a grandfather again. Luke and his wife, Hannah, are expecting. And so anyway, my life is full when it comes to family. I have been the pastor of Bethlehem Bible Church for 27 years. But let's see, maybe a full 27 now, going into the 28th year this February. That's in central Massachusetts. 
used to be a Baptist General Conference church, and now we just are non-affiliated. I don't like to say independent because that is King James only-ish language, at least from around here. I am the the radio host of No Compromise Radio. When it used to be radio, now it's just No Compromise Podcast. And I don't know what else I do. Uh, I have been going through leukemia treatments the last two months or so. Things have been going well. I don't have to go to the hospital twice a week anymore. I just go once a month. And I've, I just did re- recorded a podcast on Cancer Isn't Your Shepherd. And for so many people that have cancer or know somebody that has cancer, they, your identity is cancer if you're not careful. Right? Every day you wake up and you say, I have cancer. That's the first thing you think about yourself. And when others kindly and rightly say, how are you doing? How are the treatments? That almost feeds into some of that too. So I try to do a show on how you could talk to people who have cancer that would feed their union with Christ and their identity in Christ versus cancer. So anyway, that's a quick update of who I am. And I forgot to mention it, but you guys said it earlier, this is my second time on your world famous podcast. So that's what I've, that's what I've got. Good. Good. So we'll have to find that, that episode and, and link it. I'm sure people will be interested in hearing that, that podcast. It doesn't, I think it comes out later this week or next week or something like that. Okay. So by the time we release this, it'll be out hopefully. Uh, justification. Let's start just by talking about what is justification. When we t- when we say the word justification, I think we we throw that around a lot, and certainly it's a biblical word. We should know what it means. But just to what do we mean when we talk about justification or the doctrine of justification? You mean what does it mean to me? <laughs> it's funny. I, <laughs> what, do you, what do you think it means? Yeah, uh, yeah. I know. Well, it's like we have these little slogans in Christianity to make it easier for us to define things and remember things. Let me think of a few. Joy, Jesus, others, you. Right? If you get that order, you have joy. Or grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. Or the one that I think is the cheesiest is Bible. Basic instructions before leaving earth. This moralistic thing. And then... It's not an acronym, but we have a slogan for justification in our circles, and it's just as if I never sinned. And of course, that's only part of it, because it's just as if I've never sinned, and just as if I've always kept the law perfectly, entirely, exactly, and perpetually. And probably one of the things that we need to know about when it comes to justification is the word to impute. Right. It was years ago when R.C. Sproul was asked, you know what, the word evangelical is so amorphous and so fluid. Maybe we need a better name. And Sproul said, maybe we should call ourselves imputationists. And I, that never really caught on, but I've always remembered the quote. And so to impute means to set something to someone's account, to reckon, to count, to charge or attribute something. And I love Philemon. I want to say chapter one, but there's only one chapter. Philemon 17 and 18. So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. And so that's just a not in the context of justification, but the word to impute or to reckon it, it helps us to find that in the context of justification. If you go to Romans chapter four, for instance, Abraham, he was, it was counted to him as righteousness. Abraham believed and, and that's what happened. And so if I had to define justification just quickly, it would be simply that God requires obedience to obey is better than sacrifice. And we don't obey. We can't obey. The fall is real, yet God still requires obedience. He also requires some death for sin. And so we've got a twofold problem. We don't obey and we've sinned. And so when God justifies us, he charges our sins. He imputes our sins. He reckons our sins to Jesus, the sinless one. And then the other imputation, because it's a double imputation and justification, Jesus's obeying, Jesus's 
law-keeping, Jesus' perfect life, is credited to our account. And this is all in the language of judicial, forensic, alien. This is not what happens in us. Things happen in us, but that's not justification. And it's a real justification. It's a real declaration that we are not guilty and that we are credited with Christ's obedience. Rome says it's a legal fiction, but it's a real thing because it's Jesus's real life's obedience underneath the law accredited to our account. And so then it's confirmed by the resurrection. How do we know this is true? It's confirmed by the resurrection. And so justification, simply put, is uh, a, a double imputation. It's our sins imputed to Christ and his righteousness imputed to us. And therefore we stand before God as perfect as Jesus is. And even though we are not in terms of internally, and the same thing with Jesus on the cross, God treated him as if he were a sinner, even though he wasn't. It was S. Lewis Johnson who said, if you look at the three thieves on the cross, excuse me, the two thieves on the cross with Jesus, the three people on the cross, one thief had sin on him and in him. One other thief had sin in him, but not on him. And Jesus in the center had sins on him, not in him. So that's a good way to think about it as well. So that's my quick definition uh, off the top of my head when it comes to justification. Yeah, this is Christianity 101, right? I mean, Martin Luther said, this is where the church stands or falls, the doctrine of justification. It it just seems like it, it should be. This is what everybody should get right. But yet, you think you see where I'm going with this. It gets muddled. And people take that definition of, the, of justification that is, that is so simple. And I think our, our listeners are, would listen to you and say, yes, that's the biblical teaching. That's the truth, the gospel. So where does the, where does the problem come in or the, the lie when it comes to justification in our contemporary context? Uh, very insightful, Colt, as you were talking about that, I thought to myself, it's true, shouldn't most Bible-believing Christians sign off on it, give no caveats, give no exceptions, give no but, they should just say, this is what we believe, period. You look at the book of Romans and you think, okay, the first few chapters, there's, we have no righteousness, then it's righteousness given uh, via imputation. And you just walk through and think this is Protestant, biblical, Pauline theology. What's the problem? And I think the problem can stem back to, it goes farther back than this, but if you go back to the Roman Catholic Church and the Reformation, this doctrine of justification as we described it and as taught in the Bible could lead to lawlessness. It could lead to sin. It could lead to unholy living. Because this doctrine of justification, which I didn't say earlier in the definition, but I could include this, this is irrevocable. This is God's declaration that cannot be changed. Uh, This is God's proclamation that, that cannot be altered. And once God justifies someone, they can no longer become unjustified. Uh, justification is the same for every single person that's justified, and it is cannot be taken away. Uh, obviously, when we sin as Christians, God can discipline us and often does, and that's a whole other subject. But justification means that God, once and forever, declares you as righteous in his sight, and all the unrighteousness is taken care of. And so if that's true, then questions come up. And of course, it's Romans chapter six. Paul anticipated the question, if we're justified by the work of another, the representative Jesus Christ, the federal head, Romans 5, 12 to 21, then shall we sin that grace might abound? The answer is, I guess you could, but you shouldn't. You must not with language that's very emphatic by Paul. And so the answer to your question, Colt, is justification described like we just described it from the Protestant sense, sola fide is scary for people. Some evangelicals even are frightened by it, and they want to say, but be careful of this or watch out for that. They don't want to just drop it in there. The opposite of justification is condemnation. And so Paul says starkly, boldly, bluntly, 
nakedly. There is no not condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. And that, that that could be a problem because for many of these folks, the motivation to obey sometimes is from fear. Sometimes it's from duty. And if it's, I'm, I don't, I'm not concerned about God punishing my sins anymore, then I can do whatever I want. And, and of course, they are mistaken because it should be the love of God in Christ that motivates us. But I think the number one reason why Protestants and Catholics have a hard time with sola fide and its implications is because it could lead to sin in their minds. So what is the popular lie that's going around about justification? I wish it wasn't very popular and I wish it wasn't a lie. <laughs> I just wish it was popular truth. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure how long ago this kind of started. It's been going on since Richard Baxter's days. Again, from, I think, a good motive, and that motive is holy living, obedience, law-keeping. The opposite of that would be some kind of scurrilous sin. Who cares about God's holiness? I've been called an antinomian because of things that I've just talked about, yet I weekly talk about how important it is to honor God out of gratitude by keeping the law. Uh, in no way, shape, or form am I saying somehow we should be lawless people. I'm not saying that at all. What I am saying is I want the categories of justification and sanctification while linked, kept separate. What I mean by that is I don't want sanctification in our response to God's sanctifying work, i.e. holy living, no to sin and yes to righteousness. I don't want that to leak into justification. And that's what happens. They're blended together, just like I don't want in the triune Godhead, I don't want in the second person, the Trinity, who uh, adds human flesh to have the deity and the humanity somehow commingle and bleed together. I don't want that justification and sanctification uh, to bleed together. So, of course, when we're justified, we will be sanctified, but there's a different category justification and sanctification. And so, I think people, they just think if we're not somehow pushing people to holy living by saying there's a final, and this is the answer your question, Jay, in a roundabout way. There's a final justification. There's a final, do you do enough works to make sure you're finally justified at the end? It's called final justification, final salvation. And I don't think they really mean a vindication. I don't think they really mean there will be fruit and evidence. I think it's used as a scare tactic. Do you have enough obedience so that you'll be finally justified. And that's basically Roman Catholicism. So the popular lie going around now by good people, by smarter people than me, probably by holier people than me, but still it's a problem, somehow jamming sanctification into justification and saying, well, you have enough holy living to withstand that day. And the problem is, man, I like to ask people this question, should Christians be afraid of judgment day? And then all of a sudden you read Heidelberg and you think, oh, Judgment Day is a comfort for Christians. Belgic, uh, on that day, the last judgment, I think it's section 37 or something on, in Belgium. It's exciting. Jesus is going to pronounce your name in front of the Father and every tear gone and every sin gone and all this stuff. I don't think Christians should be afraid of Judgment Day because of justification. All their sins have already been paid for. No double jeopardy, no double payment. They have been paid in full. Jesus, one word on the cross, tetelestai, it means paid in full. And if they've been paid in full, they in fact have been paid in full. So the lie going around is that you have to have, you better have enough sanctification to prove your justification. Do you think this goes, do you think some of this goes back to the fact that we just have a, a difficult, time trusting uh, the the lord in that yes we we believe that that he can justify us but we don't we have trouble believing that he's going to sanctify us too because he is the right he is the sanctifier who who sanctifies we sometimes we think that's our job that that we just sanctify our, ourselves he justifies we sanctify but he's the sanctifier so even in the doctrine of sanctification we're resting and trusting in who he is great so i think when we start saying, this is my job, that I'm the sanctifier, I'm going to do this, then of course we're going to say we never do it enough. We never have enough to meet the end or whatever. And no, I, that's, that's insightful because what happens is 
a wrong definition of things causes problems. And so if we've got justification wrong, okay, that's a problem. But also when we have, as you rightly said, gold sanctification wrong, I'd say 99% of Christians, if asked what is sanctification, they will talk about their role or God's role with their role put together in kind of a synergistic way. And we believe and teach that sanctification is God's work, right? We talk a lot about Christ for pardon, justification, Christ for power. He gives us his Holy Spirit so we can say yes to righteousness and no to sin. But God is the one who sanctifies. And so, like you said, if we get sanctification wrong, then this other stuff goes along with it, right? It's just the domino, one thing after another. And so technically speaking, God is the sanctifier. And we respond to God's sanctifying work with no to sin and yes to righteousness. And when God justifies, he, he sanctifies. They're separate things, but they, they go together. And I, I would never say, oh, and I think some of this comes up with a lot of lordship stuff. Uh, someone lives a very unholy life, but they profess Christ as, at, at you know, 12 years old and they live with their girlfriend for 20 years. And obviously, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 9 through 11, talk about people who live unrighteously and they're not going to inherit the kingdom. I think that's part of the conversation, except here's how I think it gets torqued. And this is T. David Gordon brought up in his book called Why Johnny Can't Preach. Does the pastor see those in the congregation as nominal Christians who need to be confronted with the law again, how can you live like that and call yourself a Christian? Or does the pastor see himself as dealing with Christians who sin, who need to be reminded that God loves them in spite of their ongoing sin? And so there's a, there's a different strategy. And so I think I used to be the one who I would say, basically, how could you live like this all week and call yourself a Christian? Now, certainly there were some that were false professors. That's true. But the majority of the time, should not a pastor uh, be the under shepherd of the sheep and remind the people? That's what we call preaching and the Lord's Supper and baptism, means of grace, where we're reminding them, yes, even though you sin, uh, God still loves you because he's not going to change in his love for you. And re relating to our subject at hand today on the podcast, Luther he realized the double truth of justification and people still sinning. We're not in glory yet. And so God justifies, but yet we still have a sin principle dwelling in us. And that's why he came up with the Latin simul, simultaneous, justus, justice, or justification, justified, et. Sproul said that's not something you do when you have food in front of you, when you edit. <laughs> it is and, as my Duolingo would show me, my Latin Duolingo, simultaneously just and sinful. And so that's what we are. And so think about Lord's Supper. You can tell what somebody thinks about this final justification and assurance and sanctification and means of grace by watching a pastor officiate the Lord's Supper. And the Lord's Supper, instead of the focus on examining yourself, maybe you shouldn't take it. Now it does say examine yourself. I'm not saying it doesn't. We can talk about what that means, but it says it. But does not Jesus say both with the bread and the cup, do this in remem remembrance of me? Aren't we to remember the Lord Jesus? Shouldn't be, that be the priority? Here's who Jesus is. And so we're reminding Christians at the Lord's Supper. If this is a means of grace, what do we, why, why do Christians need that? Because no matter what you've done in the last month, if you celebrate communion monthly, what you've done in the last week, if you celebrate it weekly, God still loves you and you're welcome to come to the table. You still are avail you still have the privilege of sitting next to Jesus at a table if it were possible. And the way I like to describe it to some of my friends is let's say you get invited to Jesus' house for dinner. Let's just say this scenario could work. It would be possible two thousand years ago. He greets you at the door and you first say to him, Lord, I've sinned against you this week. Please forgive me. Of course I forgive you. Now please come and sit at my right hand side. Sit next to me. We're going to have a meal. I still welcome you. I love you. That's what the Lord's Supper is supposed to be. Not, I wonder if I should take it this week because I didn't read my Bible enough. I remember asking somebody once about having communion more. And the response I got was, do you think people would obey better then? Well, if it was out of gratitude, maybe. Right. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
of fear is a hard road when it comes to motivation. Even some of the words we throw around, the fear of the Lord. And if you think through that a little bit, it's helpful. So the fear of the Lord, beginning of wisdom. We agree, Proverbs. If you look at Job, I think at the center theologically of the book of Job, chapter 28, it's the fear of the Lord. And over and over that theme, the fear of Yahweh. Do we need to fear God? What kind of fear is that? And so there's two kinds of fear that the listeners should beware of. The first fear is a person who's an unbeliever and they know they're sinful. Maybe they don't even know they're sinful, but they are sinful. And God is holy. And it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. They should be afraid. They should be petrified uh, of what would happen on that day when they meet God face to face. As Michael Horton used to say, it's going to be like a nuclear winter and sin and holiness collide. And so there, people should fear God in that regard. My question, though, is that the way a a believer should act toward God. And since God now is the father of believers because of the work of the Son and the Spirit, do we fear God in that kind of cringing way? Uh, No, we fear God in a different way. Uh, Luther called the first kind of fear I described a servile fear. And he calls the fear of of a child of God an adopted child of God's son or, or, or daughter, a filial fear. And that's just a Latin word for son, a son or a daughter. And so we now respect our father on earth. We respect uh, our dad. We respect and are in awe of our father who protects and provides. And so how much more when it comes to the he father, and we want his name to be exalted. We want him to look good. We want to uh, honor him out of awe and thankfulness and gratitude, but never cringing servile fear because we're a child and we don't have to do that. He might again take the rod out, discipline us as it were, but so many things are, are solved when we realize we are now uh, declared righteous. We've now been given the spirit of God. We've a been adopted as children, and we have a heavenly father, and our relationship to God now is father and not judge. That solves so many problems. Think about it, dear listeners. I am a sinful dad, and I would never, ever kick one of my children out of my house and take their last name away. I might kick them out of the house, but I'd never take their last name away. I have to edit their theological edit. I never take their last name away because they're my child. And so if I wouldn't do that, how about the Heavenly Father when Jesus paid for the sins of that person and when Jesus lived for them, obeying the law for that person, and they've been declared righteous and they're now united with Christ and all the other things that go along with salvation? God is not going to undo that work. If I wouldn't do it, certainly the Heavenly Father who's perfect, he wouldn't do it. And I think sometimes we just forget what's it mean to have God as Father. And that's why final justification, final salvation, one more reason why I think it's bogus is because it doesn't understand what adoption is and it doesn't understand what the Father is. J.I. Packer said, the one word that describes Christianity the best might just be Father. We now have a Heavenly Father who loves us in eternity past. He didn't love us because the Son died for us. He loved us and sent the Son who also loved us, the Spirit of God who also loves us. And if he's going to do that, the greater, then won't he do the lesser? And if he does all the work, and this getting back to Colt's comment earlier, if he does all the work of justification, he, God, and he's doing all the work of sanctification. Won't that sanctifying work that he does be enough to get us through that final judgment? And even if you look at Revelation chapter 20, what's the final judgment for the unbeliever? It's his deeds. Sometimes just read Revelation 20 again. It's the deeds on that day. It's like all the deeds will be judged. But it doesn't talk about the deeds being judged for the believer. It says his name will be written in the book. Why doesn't it talk about deeds? Because all those deeds have been wiped away by forgiveness, those sinful deeds. As I'm going to just stay here on a roll, and I should probably land the plane so you guys can talk. Do we really think our good works can really vindicate at the very end? How many good works must I have? We forget even our best works are tainted. They're tainted by sin. And so why does God accept any of our good works? 
Calvin said, and I think he's right, because he accepts us. Therefore, he accepts our less than perfect good works. And if he accepts us and we're in union with Christ, then we're not going to make it through the final judgment. Of course we are. And so I, I like to say all the time, children give me pictures of me when I'm preaching. So they draw me instead of listening to my sermons like good children. They draw me a stick figure and they give it to me and I make a big deal about it. Oh, thanks for the picture. And I put it up on my door. I tape it up there. Come on, let's put it up together. And I say, thank you. But they're really bad pictures. They don't look like me. I wish I was that thin, but it's a horrible picture. But why do I put that up there? Because I accept the child. Therefore, I accept the less than perfect drawing. Or if you make your mom something for Mother's Day, it's horrible, but she accepts it anyway because she accepts you. So if God accepts you, he's going to accept your less than perfect works. When I have the final judgment, if it were for works, my works aren't going to be perfect anyway. They're just making the law lighter or the works not quite as bad as they would be. But Christians, we don't even have good works perfectly good because nothing we do here on earth is perfect outside of Christ. Yeah. And to, and I just want to reiterate something, and you've said this a few times already, that I'm anticipating the question again, what is the motivation for obedience? If we're talking about this, that Christ has done it all, Christ is the justifier, he's the sanctifier, you're good in Christ, then what is the motivation? And you've said already that the motivation is gratitude. Gratitude for what? And I, I guess I, I just want you to explain a, a little bit uh, the importance of the gospel message in uh, preaching. Why should the Christian constantly be grateful and move to obedience? Because so much of our preaching today is, um, like you said, law. And there's not really a, there's, you don't see the motivation. Um, Interesting question, because back to T. David Gordon's book, he says something like this. If you invite someone from another country that knows nothing about Christianity, but they speak English well, and they sit in your worship service on Sunday at the church you're at, and you ask them afterward, what do you think Christianity is about? Most of them probably would say, be good, do the right thing. And of course, that's a consequence of Christianity. We want to do things that are good and right and wholesome, et cetera, moral, pure. But that's not the message of Christianity. The message of Christianity is not be good. That is a, a fruit or an evidence it's downstream a little bit. But the core, when we say the most important thing in all the world, Paul said of a first importance I delivered to you, First Corinthians 15, it's good news. And that's what gospel means. It just means a proclamation of good news. Uh, the war is over. It's a boy. Uh, your grandson is born. There's these statements and they don't require anything. There's a response, but uh, there's no command in this good news, right? The gospel isn't believe on the Lord Jesus. The gospel is here's who the Lord Jesus is, grace incarnate. You can think about the gospel. If I talk about Jesus a lot, what about the other members of the Trinity? It, it's been said by some of the church fathers, when you say Jesus, you always think of the Father who sent Jesus. When you say the Father, you think about how he sends the Son and how the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. So when I say one, I mean them all. When I say them all, I'm talking about the one, back to the three and one or one and three. What we need is we need to make sure we keep telling people about who God is. That's the proclamation, who God is and what he does. And I think, Colt, if I did something nice for you and then ask you to do something for me, you probably want to do it. And I know the analogy is going to break down here a little bit, but if you needed a kidney and I gave you my kidney so you didn't have to go on dialysis, my guess is I could ask you for about anything and you'd probably do it. What, because there's a contract? Because there's a clause in the lawyer's fine print? No, you'd say he has done something so sacrificial that cost him and I've received freely. I think I'd just like to respond with, thank you. Whatever you want to ask me, somebody does something nice for your child. We could even push it to that. Someone gives a kidney to your child. What would you not do for them? And I don't think it would be done because of fear. I don't think it would be done because I'd say, I better do this to prove that I'm still the father of that daughter. And we could just keep extrapolating all this. We do it out of gratitude. So how much more the greatest thing that could ever be given to a person on earth? I'm talking 
the greatest is forgiveness full and free. And forgiveness is costly to the one who's offering forgiveness and granting forgiveness. And so here it is, the Lord Jesus, and you can just back right up to Philippians chapter 2, obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. What does that mean? Whole life of suffering, starting in the, in the in, not in the garden, but in the wilderness, temptations by Satan, working up to Gethsemane, working up to uh, the crucifixion, etc. And so when God does that for us, our response should be gratitude. It should be thankfulness. It should be, this is what happens. And so as I'm trying to think of a verse, I love Titus chapter 2, verse 11, for the grace of God has appeared, incarnation bringing salvation to all men. What does grace do? Does grace say, oh, just sin more, just take advantage of it, sin that grace might abound? No, here's what it says. Here's what grace does. Instructing us to deny ungodliness, that's what we call mortification, and worldly desires, and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. So it is grace that motivates and it is grace that helps us that's why in answer to your question see how long i give these long answers the answer to the question is law doesn't motivate it just directs it condemns depending on if the person's a believer unbeliever law never motivates and i think it's my friend john fonville who said it's like a boat that has gps and an engine the GPS doesn't get you anywhere. It's the engine that gets you someplace. GPS just says, stay on target, turn around, go that way. GPS is like the law, but it doesn't motivate. You need engines. What's the engine? Titus chapter 2 says, the engine is the grace of God in Christ Jesus, which motivates. Therefore, Paul says in Romans chapter 12, because of all these mercies, therefore, I want you to obey. So back to the, yeah, that was really good. Back to the final justification. Who, where do we see this? Who's been teaching this? Where has it been prevalent? I was in Omaha a while ago for the Pactum Conference that my brother puts together, Pat Abendroth, and he had me do a message called The Myth of Final Justification. And when I had some of the quotes, I want to say right away, some of these people are smarter than I am. They're probably all smarter than I am more godly. It has nothing to do with some personality attack or something like that. I just think if you write and you teach and you instruct people publicly, then you could be publicly corrected. And of course, if I stick my chin out like I do in the radio show, if somebody comes after me, they say the right thing, then I just need to take it. I think behind it all, Jay and Colt, is there are people who I don't know what you, happened. You said Jay and Colt, and Jay just disappeared. I know, I know. <laughs> so it's just Colt, uh, but that's okay. Uh, they influence the people that I pastor. So in the old days, before internet, before a lot of media, here I am in central Massachusetts, 60 miles from where Edwards was and, and other people, Solomon Stoddard. You, you wouldn't get many influences for the pro or for the negative out in the middle of nowhere. Now, when Piper writes a book, or Schreiner writes a book, or Doug Moo writes a book, or Greg Beal writes a book, or we have the books from Richard Baxter, or Salvation by Allegiance Alone by Matthew someone, I can't remember his last name at the time. When people write things, then they affect folks that I shepherd. And I think it takes away from the work of Christ. They would disagree, these writers. But I also think it takes away from assurance and Greg Beal, most of the stuff is awesome. His stuff that I really like and I have appreciated. But somehow, and I can't remember who Beal's influences were, but I know with Piper and Schreiner, Piper more influenced maybe by Daniel Fuller. If you don't have Law Gospel down and you just see this continuum and Fuller writing things that I don't think were very helpful at all, then this stuff pops up about final justification. And then they go to James chapter 2, are really the key verses, Romans 2, 13. This is the litmus test that most people need to go to when they hear them talk. And those folks that I just mentioned, I think to a person, they would teach Romans 2, 13 differently than I would. Romans 2, 13, it's not the hearers of the law who are just 
justified before God or who are just before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. And so you better be doing to make sure you're finally justified. They will all teach. This is how you're initially justified. They'll teach it rightly. I don't mean Baxter, but the modern ones I just listed. You've got John Piper who writes a book against N.T. Wright about justification and the initial justification is right and they understand it properly and rightly. But then if you look at a verse like this, the doers of the law shall be justified. So there needs to be, according to them, enough holy living to withstand the final justification. But of course, we know that Romans 1 and 2 and part of 3 is trying to show Paul is trying to show that we don't have righteousness of our own and we need righteousness. This is not in the sanctification section, the holy living section. This is in the law section. Sanctification, holy living, obedience as Christians, that's in chapter 6 and 7. And of course, some things we need to obey in chapter 12 and following. But this is trying to say to the moralistic person, the Jewish person, the religious person, while you may not be as bad as chapter one pagan, God gave them over to do the various lusts. God gave them over. God gave them over three times. I've got a question for you. Here's my question that Paul asks. Do you perfectly obey the law? Because if you don't perfectly obey the law, you're no better than these crazy pagans and Gentiles in chapter one. He asked the question, it's not the hearers of the law who are just before God, but the doers of the law. Do you do the law? And to use the, law, the language of Westminster, is it perfect law keeping, entire law keeping, exact law keeping, internal, external, and perfect? And so the answer is no, I need righteousness from another. And therefore, with Piper and some of the other gardens, unguarded statements by the others, they make you think you've got to do all this obedience to make sure your initial justification is a keeper, right? You go fishing and I can't have anything less than 12 inch smallmouth bass or something. And so th they do it. The other thing that happens, and Jay sent me an email, what about when people quote reformers who seem to be teaching? what Piper and Schreiner and Moo and these other guys were teaching. What about that? And the best thing I could say is, I think you should read the entire section and not pull out one of these quotes. There's a list going around by several people who have put together quotes, no context of the quotes, just quotes that seem to be saying something like Piper's saying. And I think they want to try to defend Piper because Piper has been used by the Lord in their life. I know lots of people and they say, I became a Calvinist because of John Piper. I, I did this because of the Lord working through John Piper's preaching. And I say, great, I'm thankful as a sinful, frail pastor that people learn because otherwise they would not learn underneath me. And I have pastors and mentors before me that I disagree with on certain things. And it's, it's not a personal thing. It's not of something, an ad hominem attack. So when people give me a Turton quote out of context, my, my son is really good at this. He likes to go look up the full quote by John Owen to see what he's actually saying. And so when Jay gave me a quote with Turton the other day, and then they said, is Turton is he off base too? Because then Piper and Schreiner, what about that? And so let me see if I can just start reading a little bit of Turretin in context. And I would say, oh, he obviously teaches this. We confess that works come in here with faith. Yes, that works only are properly regarded because it is concerned with the justification of faith, which can be gathered from no other source more certainly than by works as its effects and indubitable truths. As we rest upon the promises in Christ as sufficient alone, not by reason of existence, but in respect to function or efficiency, not by way of preparation with other virtues or of merit, but relatively after the manner and of an instrument, apprehending the satisfaction of Christ and fiduciously applying it. The Romanists we deny, we assert, Although living faith is never alone in the person who is justified, listen, here's what Turton says. If you don't understand anything I just said before, because he's hard to read, here's where we hunker down. Although living faith is never alone in the person who is justified, still it is alone in the very act of justification. 
to the production of which the other virtues can contribute nothing. Faith alone, claiming this privilege for itself, as we have said before. It is one thing for love and works to be required in the person who is justified. Another in the act itself are causality of justification, which we deny. In other words, I could put it this way. There's no conditions when it comes to faith, but there are consequences when it comes to works, no conditions, but there are consequent works. That's just how we talk. Conditions, consequences, I, but I don't want to somehow be unguarded in my statements like sometimes I think Piper is. And maybe he does that because he's trying to get a point across. And so hyperbole, exaggeration, jolting, jarring. I know you think it's salvation by faith alone, but that's not how you get to heaven by faith alone. You don't attain heaven by faith alone to try to get your attention. I don't know if it's that or not, but Turretin does not teach what John Piper teaches. No, I think that's, I think that's fascinating. I, I listened to a, a podcast not long ago where the, the host read some statements that have been going around by Turretin and, and others. And boy, they, they sound like they're teaching the same thing as Piper and these guys. But then he read them in context and it just changed the whole dynamic. Was that Patrick Hines? Probably. I don't know. Jay sent it to me. Okay, yeah. I, I know Patrick Hines is really good on that because then he uh, will pull up the full quote and look at it. I think if we just had to summarize some of this stuff, if you read Puritans and Reformers and good works as evidence, then you're fine. If you see them as fruit, you're fine. But if you make them the ground or the condition, you really... Uh, need to run from that. If you want to attain heaven by obedience, uh, attain heaven by law keeping, then as, as one man said, who lived a life in such a way where they merited heaven? What does union with Christ mean? It means you're united with Christ, but then judged on your own performance at the end. What does sola fide really mean? Right? It, it, and so then you see the Doug Wilsons of the world adding in either love or obedience in the faith. It's not knowledge, assent, and trust anymore. It's living, it's active, it's, it's loving, it's all these other things. And so I just think if you're a public speaker, preacher, you should just do what Turretin does, and that is be plain. And we believe this, we deny this, and we distinguish this way. I like to say to people, for years, I think I taught the. I did teach the wrong. I, thing I lost my internet. Eternal functional subordination. <laughs> I won't blame anybody. It's on me. I was influenced by people, but I'm thinking, oh yeah, wives should have no problem submitting to husbands because Jesus submits to the Father in eternity past. I had no idea. So shame on me. That was sinful, and what I taught was sin. So how can I correct that by just blurring things now and trying to talk in a tricky way? I can say. What I taught was wrong. The only way there should be submission when it comes to Jesus and the Father is the incarnation. That's it. When Jesus add the eternal Son, adds humanity, which adds another will, and now that human will is submitting to the divine will of the Father. Therefore, I don't teach that anymore, and I don't need to have wives submit to husbands because of Trinitarian subordination. They can submit to their husbands in other ways with other verses in Colossians, et cetera. And so I don't teach that anymore. I teach this now. I teach that in eternity past, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, one God, one essence, one nature. There can't be any subordination. Just because I say Father and Son, that doesn't mean we make it run on all fours. It's a term of relationship. In our world, fathers used to be sons. In eternity past, that doesn't happen. And then at the incarnation, and then I say, I'm not teaching this, I'm teaching that. That's what I want these people to do, is just be clear and then just admit the issue versus somehow saying, here's what they're essentially saying, to be declared righteous by imputation is less than adequate to attain heaven. It's just, that's not true. You don't need more than Christ's righteousness to get to heaven. You don't need your righteousness because, as I said earlier, your righteousness, even as a Christian, is tainted, right? We have not done one thing perfectly ever, even as Christians. 
even our faith, think about it. Let's even go back to our faith. Our faith is not a perfect faith, but it doesn't need to be. It can be weak, sin-tainted, <laughs> imperfect, but as long as we have the knowledge, assent, and trust, there's this fiduciary trust in the work of another, that, that means we can have all of Jesus, even though we have a little faith. And so if we have a little faith in a great Jesus, won't that get us through that final justification as well? If you've been justified, can it be revoked? Can you be unjustified because you didn't have enough uh, righteousness? It is Benjamin Keach who said, once we're justified, we need not inquire how a man is justified after he is justified. Yeah. I think you said it well earlier that you can get justification right and you can talk about it really well. And then as soon as you add this final justification by works, it renders that first one null and void. What was the, it didn't matter that you got it right. Initially, if you add to it later, then you've messed up the entire doctrine. That's right. And you'll see in Piper too, he has this desire for holy living and fruit and passion and everything else, but he's untethered from confessions. So some of this stuff is a biblicism. Uh, in the old days when I would do Bible study, I would say, I don't know between these two options what this verse means. And I would look up my favorite theologian on earth, my pastor, what does he say? Okay, I guess you could do that. There's nothing necessarily wrong with it, unless that's the only thing you do. Now what I tend to do is, okay, there's a controversy with justification and sanctification. There's a controversy about lordship. There's a controversy about assurance. There's a controversy about sanctification. Is it monergistic? Is it synergistic? There's a controversy about eternal functional subordination. There's a controversy, whatever. Now, I look in the past and say, I think the reformers talked about that. I think the confessions talked about that. I think the creeds said something about that. And so instead of going to one person, then you go to Westminster Confession and there's 200 plus men who are trying to hammer these things out. And so that's what I would think Piper would be helped by is if he had some confessional restraints to guard him. I'd take my children bowling and when they were tiny, you had to put those things down in the gutters to keep the ball going all the way down. And those little gutter guards are called confessions. To make sure we're not teaching anything new. <laughs> there are mistakes in the confessions. I just don't know that of that many yet. And so until I find out what they are, then I, I just Jay, where did you go? Did you have to go run an errand? Where were you? You can talk, Jay. Oh, okay. <laughs> Let me give you a quote by John Owen. And you don't need even context for this because he's very clear. Those of the Roman church do ground their whole doctrine of justification upon a distinction of double justification, which they call the first and the second. The first justification, they say, is by faith. The obedience and satisfaction of Christ being only meritorious cause thereof. The second justification, the proper formal cause thereof, is good works proceeding from the principle of grace and love. Works of John Owen, volume five, page 138 and 139. It's Rome who did that. They've got the double justification. They're the blenders of justification and sanctification. Owen said, I say, therefore, that the evangelical justification, which alone we plead about, is but one, and it is at once completed. About any other justification before God but one, we will not contend with any of the Roman church who does ground their whole doctrine of justification on a distinction of double justification. The distinction was coined unto no other end but to bring in confusion into the whole doctrine of the gospel. Justification it, through free grace of God by faith in the blood of Christ is evacuated by it. Sanctification is turned into justification and corrupted by making the fruits of it meritorious. The whole nature of evangelical justification, consisting in the gratuitous pardon of sin and imputation of righteousness, and the very declaration of a believing sinner to be righteous thereof, as the word alone signifies, is utterly defeated by it. In other words, it's Roman Catholic. It blends justification and sanctification. And if you do that, you no longer have sola fide. I should, well, have, quoted that. I should have quoted that in Omaha, but I ran out of time. Speaking of running out of time, we've, we've 
bypassed our, our time limit. Mike, thank you so much for being on today. Is there anything else that I would ask you if there's some resources that you would uh, want to give us that would help? Uh, reformers, read Turretin in context. If you're a lay person listening, one of the best things I think you could do is read Romans and Galatians because Paul will make sure that you try to realize it's faith alone, it's sola fide in, in Christ's work. I think there's been a retrieval and a renewal of interest in confessions. And I have a book that has a bunch of the confessions together. There's a synopsis, a harmony of the confessions by Sinclair Ferguson, which is good, Beaky and Ferguson called Reformed Confessions Harmonize. I find that good. And then there's another professor that put together a bunch of confessions. There's a Crossway ESV study Bible with confessions, not study Bible, but a confessions Bible. And you just read through them and you think, oh, that's good. I have an app on my phone that's Reformed Creeds and Confessions. And you read Heidelberg 1 and 2 and you think, man, that's so devotional. We think of, of them so dry, but they're not at all. So that's what I would do. And then I would pick up something easy to read. Burkhoff Systematic Theology, or Michael Horton's Pilgrim Theology, and just every once in a while, read a page or two. I think people get bogged down by thinking, it's a book, I have to read this book straight through. Or you just read a page or two. I have Turretin in front of me, and I just read a page or two because my mind is blown after one page. <laughs> I can't read it anymore. So <laughs> those are some of the things I think they could do. Very good. Thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Very helpful. So. Thank you. Glad to be on, guys. Let, let me know when you post this. And if I have your permission, then I'll splice it in half and run it on No Compromise Radio, too. How's that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Thanks for being on. I appreciate your ministry. Thanks. I mean, I, I didn't mean to say thanks for being on. Thanks. I'm usually the host. I'm usually the host. Thanks for allowing me to be on. And next time, it helps if you guys can figure out what Central Standard Time is. Yeah. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening. You can find more out about us or check out past episodes on the web at renewalcast.com. You can connect with us on social media. For instance, you can go to facebook.com slash renewalcast. Have a great week.